last lecture, the place we stopped was the following. We started by the requirement that if I have a vector field V i and I parallel transport it, then if I want to get a unique vector out of it everywhere, then I need to satisfy a particular condition which we wrote down as uh, in the following way as k l v k d x l. This quantity we said should vanish. Okay, I hope you remember the starting point. So, we said this has to vanish, which led to us to a differential equation for V, which we wrote as d L of V i plus gamma k um, gamma v k equal to 0. Okay. So, let us again go through it making sure we understand what we mean. We are given a vector at some given point and we are given a curve, then we know how to parallel transport the vector along that curve. Then we said we want something more ambitious to happen. Irrespective of which curve I am choosing, when I do the parallel transport, the vector at the other end should be the same. For that, this differential equation, this equation has to be satisfied, which we converted into this differential equation, which has absolutely no reference to any curve. This is just a differential equation in the space time, where gammas are given as functions. Then we said that in general, this differential equation will not have a unique solution, and there is a condition, integrability condition on that, and that integrability condition is essentially, if I take one more derivative here and commute them, I should get 0 because the partial derivatives has to commute, so that this V i will be an exact differential. And I also told you that you just think of this as something in thermodynamics. D of some quantity V i can be written as something into D x 1 plus something into D x 2, something into D x 3. If you just write it down, there is no guarantee that a state function of that kind will exist in thermodynamics. And the existence requires certain condition to be satisfied. This is analogous to that. Then we worked it out and we found that the condition turns out to be the vanishing of an object, which I call curvature tensor, which I will write it as some R i k L m. And I told you the mnemonic for writing down the curvature tensor, it has four indices. One is a special index and there are three here. And what you do is that you think of it as d L gamma m of some matrices minus d m gamma L and then the product of these two matrices with a commutation. So, it is gamma M gamma L minus gamma L gamma M. This is not difficult to remember and then you just add on the other two i k index. So, you put an i here and a k here and you put an i here and a k here. This is a product of matrices. So, you put an i here and a k here and of course, you need some, some dummy index here to sum over. So, again i, k and a dummy index to sum over. Okay. So, that is the way to remember this and it is also uh, the nice way to think about it because in gauge theories, you will only have two indices L and M. And it will have exactly the structure I wrote down d L of gamma m minus d m of gamma L, gamma m gamma L minus gamma L gamma m, where all the gammas are actually matrices. These are matrices in a given representation of a gauge theory. So, this is the right thing to do. And if this quantity is 0, we knew that this, this differential partial differential equation will have a unique solution. So, just to sort of stress that again, what does it mean in practical terms? So, let us think about this in two dimension. Suppose, you are given a two dimensional space and suppose somebody has given you the polar coordinate. So, the matrix are uh, non-trivial functions of space and then you can compute your gamma. Then you go ahead and compute this r and you will find that they are 0. What it means in physical terms is that you were given a space 
So, let me draw that space like this with some unit vectors here. The unit vectors are just another way of thinking in terms of the coordinate lines. The unit vectors are tangents to the coordinate lines. The coordinate lines here are circles and straight lines. Right? The tangents to that is what gives you the line. So, there is a coordinate grid and these vectors are tangential to these grids. What this going to 0 means is that now you take this point and you take a curve from this point to this point, any curve you like. Okay? And you parallel transport these two vectors along that curve. We know that it does not matter which curve I am going to use or you integrate these equations either way. When you do this, you will end up getting two vectors which are of this kind. Of course, the basis vectors this fellow has given you will be pointing in completely different direction, but that does not matter. You take this vector field and you can parallel transport everywhere and you have got a Cartesian grid because now of course, the Cartesian grid is wonky compared to this, but that does not matter. So, it is a rotated Cartesian grid. So, this tells you in a constructive way that given a coordinate system, which in which the metric has non-trivial space dependent component, if this thing vanishes, you have a way of constructing the Cartesian coordinate system, because that space is flat and there is a global existence of a global Cartesian coordinate system is same as the space being a flat. Okay? So, this is the first thing which we did. Now, I want to go a bit further and give two more interpretations to this object. Okay? And both of them are going to be quite important. The second one is the most important one because it is physics oriented, but unfortunately that is also the most complicated to prove. So, I will come to that in the end. So, I will do one more mathematical step and then we will come back to that. So, the second way in which I am going to interpret this, again let me do the maths first and then I will try to get the physics out of it. What I want to do is to concentrate on one more feature of the covariant derivative, which we have not looked at so far. Consider the following quantity d i d j of some vector, let me call it v k. Okay? If these were ordinary derivatives, then d i d j is the same as d j d i. If they are covariant derivatives, it turns out that they are not the same. So, the covariant derivatives in differentiation does not commute. It is a bit strange because we said that this is like a derivative and that um, it has all kinds of nice features of a derivative like product rule etcetera. But one nice feature which we had usually is that the derivatives will commute, partial derivatives will commute, covariant derivatives will not. There is a physical reason why it will not. Uh, but let me first work this out mathematically and then we will come to that. So, what I want to do is to compute this quantity, then change i and j and subtract it out. To save some work, when I am working it out, anything which is obviously symmetric in i and j, I will not even write it down, because those terms are going to go away when I subtract. Okay? Fine. So, let us do that. This is going to be first the ordinary derivative of this tensorial object. Think of this as a tensorial object with two indices, we have to compute its covariant derivative. So, we know the rule for that. So, we have to first write down the ordinary derivative, which is nabla j v k. Then, we have to correct for the indices. So, we will first correct for the index on top, which is k. So, I have to put a gamma and the k goes there differentiating index is i that sits there. Then I have an L and then V j d j of V L. Okay? Then I had to correct for the j that is again gamma. I am correcting for j. So, the j goes here differentiating index is i. I put an L then this is L and V k. Okay, let us make sure this is correct. You, you have followed this step. right? Okay. Now, we work it through again. So, we want to expand it out. 
So, this d j v k I am going to expand. So, first I am going to have a term here there will be a partial derivative with respect to j. I do not have to write it down because that is d i d j when I subtract that will go away. So, I will say I will put dot 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 to remind you that there are terms which are symmetric in i and j which I am not writing it down. Then I begin with the term which is which I have to write down which is d i of yes gamma terms. So, it is gamma k j going here and let us say a v a I have to take that term. Then let us go through this. I have gamma k l i d j of v l plus gamma l j k v k. What? That is correct. This gamma comes from this. No, no. Inside uh, you use k again, but outside there is already one. Yes, it is better not to use k. That is correct. So, let us say a, a. I am not going to write it down, because even though I laboriously wrote down first, it is symmetric in j and i. Okay? So, that is dumped into this region. Okay? Now, let us work this out further. I am going to get d i of gamma, let me write it as k j a v a, the derivative with respect to gamma. Then I am going to have a term, which is gamma k a j d i of v a. Okay? Then you look at this term. Okay, let me write it down. They are going to cancel, but I will write it down and then show they cancel. Gamma k a j d i of v a. This is the second term. So, I have written down both. Then let us look at the first term here, which is gamma k l i d j of v l. Let me write down the last time as well. Gamma k i, i first, then l gamma l a j v a. If you look at these two terms, what you will find is that there is a A and an A contraction, which I could have called L just to make life very easy. Not exactly doubled. There is an I and a J, here there is an I and a J, I and a J, which are interchange. Therefore, this is symmetric in I and J. Anything symmetric in I and J, I do not have to care. So, I am only left with these two terms. Therefore, I can write, now we do the explicit anti symmetrization that d i d j minus d j d i. So, I am taking the commutator on the left hand side already, the whole thing acting on v k. I am left with this term and the last term, both as nicely V a dotting outside. So, I only have to write down the interior terms. So, that is d i of gamma, that first term gamma k on top j a. And when I do the anti symmetrization, I will pick up a d j gamma k. I a 
fine. Then let us pick up the last term which I have. It is going to be gamma k, there is a i l gamma l j a or a j does not matter. Okay. Minus the same thing with uh, i and j interchange gamma k j l gamma l a i. This whole thing is multiplied by b a. Now, this you recognize what it is, because this is nothing but your Riemann Christopher or curvature tensor is also called Riemann Christopher tensor. It is R k a i j of b a. It is a bit of a maths, but I think the result is worth the effort. So, now let us see what we have. The first thing which we know, yeah, is that fine? Yeah, that, you see the way to remember is whatever is doing all these differentiations is anti symmetric and that should go right at the end at i j and the rest are matrix indices and there is only one way you can contract them. Okay. Now, the first thing which we know from here is that your R k A i j, this curvature tensor or Riemann Christopher tensor I brought in is a genuine tensor. Because last time when I did that, I said yeah it is sort of obvious, but I am not perfectly happy with the level of rigor there. Because you wrote down a quantity in terms of gammas and if there are one set of quantities which we know which are not tensors, it is gammas. Therefore, it is not clear whether this crazy combination is going to be tensorial or not. But here everything is manifestly covariant. The left hand side is a completely generally covariant object. We are uh, dotting it with a V A. Therefore, this is a generally covariant object. So, this is a tensor. Second, it tells you that because it is a tensor, if it vanishes in one frame, it will vanish in all frame. So, it first tells you that in flat space time it is 0, because in flat space time by definition I can choose Cartesian coordinates, gammas vanish, therefore this will vanish. So, we have proved that flat space time implies vanishing of the curvature tensor. We also know that the vanishing of the curvature tensor implies flat space time, that is what we did first. Because if the curvature tensor vanishes, you choose any coordinate axis which you like, then just parallel transport it globally. You will get a unique answer, therefore, you have a global Cartesian uh, tensor set. I mean this can be done more formally, but essentially this is the idea. Therefore, if the Kleinman Christopher tensor vanishes, it is flat space time and vice versa. This is the criterion which I told you in day 1 that uh, there is a constructive way of figuring out whether some metric is flat or not. So, if the metric is flat, then I should be able to go and uh, compute this quantity and fix this. I also, now I want to take up the next most important property of this, I am going to do that. But before I do that, I want you to notice one thing which is sort of obvious, but you, you just to stress the point, this involves second derivatives of the matrix, right. Because these things are fine, these are just quadratic in the first derivatives of the matrix, but these terms are going to involve second derivatives of the matrix. So, this is a new creature, because the metric is like a potential. So, we are now talking about second derivatives of the potential. Very unfortunately, this is not taught in Newtonian gravity classes, while they should have. So, I will explain that, but that is why I am going to spend some time and why these second derivatives are important objects and those second derivatives are what is appearing here. Very intuitively, you can also understand curvature as dependent on Dan, because even in a normal case, like if you are looking at a curve in two dimensional space. What you always call curvature is the second derivative of y with respect to x. So, the, the first derivative is you can, you can always make it uh, go away. I mean in this particular case, we can always choose gammas to be 0 at a given point, but you cannot make the derivatives of gamma vanish. Okay. So, just remember that it does involve second derivatives of the matrix. Now, I want to give you a physical feel for these second derivatives. Let me do that. 
Ideally, this is the way curvature should be introduced, but uh, it is a little tricky. So, that is why I decided to do it in the mathematical way and then come to this. To do this, I want to introduce a concept of what is known as geodesic deviation. Okay. So, it, it goes under the technical term geodesic deviation. So, let me write it down. But it is an extremely elementary concept. So, I want to first illustrate it in Newtonian theory and then go over to general relativity. So, in Newtonian theory, if you go back to the first or second lecture, when we introduced principle of equivalence, we said that if I let two balls down, in a uniformly accelerated frame, the separation between them is going to remain the same, but in a genuine gravitational field, the, the separation is going to change. Now, we have come a long way from there. At some stage, we said that when you have balls in uh, gravitational fields, they are not going to go according to Newton's law, but they are going to follow geodesics. Right? So, I have two nearby geodesics and I want to ask how does the separation between two nearby geodesics change. Okay? So, there is a formal missionary for doing this, which is extremely useful and you should learn. So, I am going to first introduce that. The missionary is the following. You consider in some region a set of geodesics. Technically, this is called a congruence of geodesics, which uh, roughly speaking in the mathematical language that to every point you have a unique geodesics and if you do not go too, wander too far away from that point, nothing bad will happen to you, that there is only one geodesic and they do not cross and things like that. Okay? But we do not need all that, but essentially we have a bunch of geodesics. You can think of them as bunch of balls which are dropped to earth from different places if you want. So, along the geodesics, there is a measure yes which tells you how far on the geodesic you have moved. Now, we also want a label on the geodesics. Okay? So, I have to introduce some something for that. Let me, let me call that v. This is some v is equal to some value. So, there are lines like this. So, I should probably use a different color. So, these are my geodesics, the red ones. Okay? Now, as you move along v, it will pick different geodesics. I have only drawn three, but it is supposed to be filled with geodesics. Okay? So, as I move along v, it will pick the geodesic and on the geodesic, if you move along s, you will know where on the geodesic you are. So, s and v will tell you a given location in space. So, any point on the geodesic can be denoted by some x i of s comma v. Well, I will tell you which geodesic and I tell you how far on that geodesic I have to go, that will denote this. This allows me to define two very useful vectors. One vector is just u i, which is uh, what you would have called d x i by d s. Normally, we would have written d x i by d s, but since x i is now sort of made to depend on two parameters, I am writing it like this. I can also now define another vector v i, which is d x i by d v. This essentially tells you the deviation between the geodesics, because this is how things are changing in the v direction. So, you have a vector which is like u i here and there is a vector v i here. So, v i sort of connect at the same as two nearby geodesics, u i sort of takes you forward along the geodesic. What we want to know is, as I move forward along the geodesic, along u i, how does the separation between the geodesics v i change? That sounds like a good thing to ask. Like, if I have a whole bunch of balls which are dropped to earth, sit on top of one of the balls and you look at the other ball and you ask whether it is coming closer to you or further away from you or not. So, you as you ride along on ball, how does the separation to the other ball change? Now, first before we do all these GR stuff, let us ask the similar question in uh, ordinary Newtonian gravity. Okay? So, in Newtonian gravity everything is three dimensional. So, I want to think of 
something like uh, a separation vector n alpha, let us say. Okay. So, this could be like some d x alpha by d n, I mean this is like v, okay. maybe I should use v itself, let me write v, v alpha which is like d x alpha by d v. Now, proper time is just ordinary time. So, what I am interested in is the quantity d square v alpha by d t square. This is what I would call the acceleration of the separation vector. So, I write on one ball, I am looking at the nearby ball and I am asking whether it is coming towards me with a with some acceleration or going away from some acceleration or whatever. In change of velocity is what we are considering, yeah. No, velocity also you can consider, but sure you can, but the point is that dv alpha by dt does not have a dynamic content, because along the t direction if I start moving in Galilean invariant, they can get screwed up. So, in Newtonian theory accelerations are absolute quantity, so we are just going to look at it. It turns out that this has a very nice equation which you can write down. Okay. Yeah, right. So, you take this and it is all Newtonian physics. So, this is going to be what? It is going to be d by d v. So, I am just going to take this quantity. So, it is d by d v of d square x alpha by d t square. This of course, is genuine honest to God uh, acceleration. Therefore, I can replace it by Newton's laws of motion. So, I get minus d by d v of d alpha of phi, phi is the gravitational potential. Right? Now, this d by d v also I can write rather nicely as minus v beta d by d x beta. So, this becomes d square phi by d x beta d x alpha. This I think is a nice equation. What it tells you is that the acceleration of the geodesic separation, I will use the word geodesic because we know that that is what it is going to be. The acceleration of the geodesic separation yeah, but we are doing Newtonian physics in 1, 1, 1 metric, so it does not matter. So, in the d square v alpha by d t square, it is given by some matrix here, which is second derivative of the potential multiplying the vector itself. Okay. Now, the question is what does this mean physically? I mean this means something extraordinarily physical and again it is not taught like that. This has to do for example, with the tides on air. Is, is not obvious. Okay, let me let me explain that to you. If you go and read some eighth standard NCRT textbook, you will find a brilliant line in it, which says that the tides produced on earth due to sun and moon are of equal magnitude, approximately equal magnitude, because the gravitational force of sun on earth and the gravitational force of moon on earth are comparable. Then of course, earth should be going around the moon. Now, if you actually do the calculation of m by r square for the sun and m by r square for the moon, you will find that the sun's force is much larger than the moon's force. That is why earth is going around the sun amongst other things and moon's force is negligible. But the tides which are produced on earth are equally contributed by both sun and the moon. I do not know how many of you have uh, thought about it. Okay. It is very closely related to the fact that if you if you had ever lived in a seashore and looked at the tides, you would have noticed this peculiar phenomena that take earth here and there is sun in this direction and you produce a tidal bulge here and you produce a tidal bulge here. What it means is that the earth and the moon, sun and the moon and whatever is the gravitational configuration, the gravitational force is attractive in one direction and repels you in the other direction. That is why this water is moving away. The water is trying to move away from the sun here, move towards the sun here. I mean that is weird. The reason is the following. 
Reason is the four sun exerts on the earth is completely irrelevant for tide. Sun is going to make this point accelerate, it is also going to make the center of the earth accelerate. If you are sitting in your coastal Bombay, you will not notice any effect due to that. Okay. What you notice is the force with which the sun is attracting this water compared to the force with which the sun is attracting the center and the difference between them. So, if the forces go as 1 by r square, the tide producing forces will go as 1 by r cubed times this distance d. This is d and the r is a distance to the sun. Okay. Now, d is like uh, this distance, so that is fixed. So, the tide producing forces go as 1 by r cube, not as 1 by r square. So, if you take the sun's mass divided by r cube to the sun and compare it with the moon's mass to r cube to the moon, not r square, you will find that they are comparable. They can be converted into the angle subtended and the density, etcetera. You should try it out. So, you will find that they are comparable because of with the moon's for tidal moon's tidal force on earth, tidal gravitational force on earth is comparable to sun's tidal gravitational force on earth, even though moon's gravity on earth is completely negligible compared to sun's gravity on earth. Now, you have seen what is involved. The tidal gravitational fields are produced by the gradient of the forces times a distance, that is precisely what this is. This d phi by d x alpha is the force, we are calculating the gradient of the force in the beta direction and multiplying by the separation. So, if I take two geodesics which are infinitesimally separated by v beta, you calculate the force on one of them, the force on the other, take the difference in the forces and you multiply by the distance that will tell you how much is the difference with which the accelerations will change, that is precisely what the left hand side is. Okay. So, in some sense you can immediately see that this is what we should be concentrating on, right? because this tells you how so to speak the gravitational force is changing from place to place. And we have already seen that the gravitational forces are like uh, uh, first derivatives of the potential, which are like first derivatives of the metric. And if you want to know how that is changing from place to place, you have to look at the second derivatives of the metric, which is what we are doing. Okay, so, this is what we should concentrate. So, I want to obtain the corresponding quantity here. So, what is the corresponding quantity here? I mean, how do I go about getting it? So, we want to look at some kind of an acceleration of the separation vector. Now, we already know how to get acceleration accelerations you get by taking u i nabla i acting on something, okay? because that is that is how you are telling how it is changing when I am moving and I have to operate twice in order to get the acceleration. This would give you as you said the first derivative and you have to get the second one. So, this operator acting twice, so it is u j d j of v i. And we want to compute this quantity. So, we will we'll probably give it a name and we will call it some d, d square of v i. Yeah. Wrong index. Wrong index? Yeah, i is already unit. So, let us take it k. Okay. K, k. And this is just a easy notation. I am just calling it d square of v k. Uh, I need one crucial identity to work this out properly. So, I will prove that identity, because that makes life very simple and then, then we can just crank turn it and do that. This is a good exercise actually, but let us first understand the physics behind it. This u i d i is an operator which tells you how things are changing as you move along a geodesic. So, we are just asking the second derivative kind of a thing, that is we are going to operate with that operator twice. Okay. So, if you think of this as something analogous to our d by d s if it has been partial derivative, it would have been d by d s. This is like d square by d s square, which is what we want to look at. So, this is the definition and we are going to look at this quantity. The result I need is the following. I have a, I can prove that u i d i of v k is equal to v i d i of u k. 
that is you write this and you just flip u and v do not change the indices. Okay. So, let us see whether this is true. The left hand side is u i d i that is going to be essentially d by d s of v k, v k is d x k by d v. Okay. V is just a variable along that line. Okay. Now, on the right hand side I have this is the left hand side. Now, right hand side is going to be similarly d by d v, because this operator is that of d x k by d s. Right? So, clearly this is implied by this, this is just second derivative. So, because they are these kind of vectors, these are called the connecting separating vectors, then this condition is true. Okay. So, we will use this condition to simplify life that is all. So, I want to work this out, let me do that in that side. So, what I need is the following. So, I am going to just expand that out, this is the expression I want to work with and this is something in which lot of people get lost, maybe I will also fumble, let us see. The trick is take away all the derivatives from v and get all the derivatives onto u. We keep doing that and things will simplify. So, what we have is that you have u i d i of we have u j v j, u j d j acting on v k. I do not like that because it is a derivative on v, I want to change it. So, that I can immediately do by flicking because of this rule. So, I write it as v by the time it goes to this side of the blackboard, I have already changed it. V j d j of u k, right. Okay. Now, expand it out. So, you get first u uh, v j outside and the d i d j, d i d j of u k, then I get a second term which is plus u i, which one? Sure, 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 very important u i. Okay. And in the second one, I have a u i then d i, okay, let me write the d j u k first, d j u k, then I have a d i v j, correct? It does not matter, I can, I can put this here. Let us see. The only term which is left is d j of u k. So, let us see whether this is correct. First, I have a u i v j times d i d j of u k. Then, in the second term, I have a d j of u k, which I am going to pull out, and what remains is u i d i of v j. Okay. I do not like derivatives on v, so I want to flip it again. So, I just put v here and a u here. Okay. Right. So, this is this is what we have. Now, what I will do is that let me just write it slightly differently. I have a d i of v j u j here and you have a d j of u k. remove it here. Okay. What I can do is that this whole thing, I mean the reason I wrote it like this is to motivate something. If this d i has been acting on this whole thing, that is very nice, because it is a u j d j of u k that is 0. Okay. So, therefore, 
I can write this as keep V i fixed outside. I can take this V i out that will act on this whole thing that is not going to give me anything. Then I will get this whole quantity to be just contributed by the second term that is this will become V i. Then this pulled out does not matter, I get minus u j d i d j of u k. Okay. Now, you find that this is almost the same as this except for a flipping indices and that flipping indices is wider. Okay. So, this I can write purely formally as minus v j u i d j d i u k. Yeah. All right. You took this and you wrote this as d i of u j d j u k minus that con See, I have taken this out, so I just have to take the derivative of that, which is u j d i d j u k. Then I notice that this quantity is 0. Okay. So, this is what I get. So, are we clear on that? So, let us, let us be sure. You start with that, you do the one flip to get to the side and then after that you differentiate and then you find there is one term which still has a v derivative which you remove by this and you have nicely one term vanishing coming because of the geodesic equation and you are left with this. So, that final answer is going to be v j u i d i d j minus d j d i of u k. Very conveniently, we have an expression for that except for uh, u and v. Okay. So, that is just going to give you Riemann Christoffel tensor. So, this is like r this term r k i j go at the end some l, then you have a u l, u i, v j. So, this is what this quantity is. So, this d square v k, which we have computed here. is r k l m p let us say u l u m v p. Yeah, this is fine. So, this is of course, you can use this m p being anti symmetric to do things and all that, but that that does not make uh, by you much. So, this is this is the final expression for what I would have called geodesic ac geodesic deviation acceleration. Okay. So, the acceleration of the geodesic deviation vector. Now, we would like to compare this with this. Okay. So, the this v k is essentially what this is going to be and this d square is what this is going to give. So, if you compare these two, what you should get is that in the Newtonian limit, I should have a result like r alpha 0 beta 0 equal to d alpha d beta of phi. Because everything else will take care of, because in the Newtonian limit, ul and um only the 0th component will contribute. 
So, this is and of course, uh, as we discussed last time, it will become c square and all the phi's which are going to come from metric can only come in the combination by phi by c square. Okay. So, c squares will cancel out. So, this quantity if it gives you that, you will be able to pick up the correct thing. Why is that? The minus sign is taken care of because when you look at this, I wrote alpha alternating indices. This is going to be some alpha, this is 0 and this is 0, but here these are the two things which are contracted. So, you have to interchange p and m. Interchanging p and m will produce a minus sign and p and m when you interchange you will get everything correct. Okay. So, that is the position of p and m should be changed that is write it as p m with a minus sign. Then the alternating indices will take care of that. This gives you your second consistency check, which I will not work out for you unlike I did it last time. So, you guys do that. Take g 0 0 to be equal to 1 plus 2 phi. That is, if you have g 0 0 equals 1 plus 2 phi, 2 phi by c square and uh, g alpha beta is essentially delta alpha beta. Do not worry about rising and lowering. Then for that metric, you should be able to show that r is given by this. So, you have to first calculate the gammas and then from the gammas, you have to compute this quantity and make sure that of course, we know it will match, but you just have to verify that the factors etcetera match. So, this is the uh, third possible way of looking at the curvature set. So, just to recapitulate, the first one we did was to say that if I have a vector field and I want a parallel transport from one point to another, I do not want it to depend on the path in which I moved if the space is flat. So, I asked what is the condition for that and I found that a particular object has to vanish. Then I also argued that the second derivatives, I mean the, uh, the commutator of the covariant derivatives taken as a pair is going to give you some quantity like this. Therefore, the commutator is in general not 0 and that commutator since it is a covariant object, what you get here is also covariant and that gave you a proof that this object is a tensor. And since I can a tensor which vanishes in one frame will vanish in all frames, I could have worked things out in flat space time and shown that in flat space time in a given coordinate system R vanishes. Thereby, we concluded that the space time being flat and the curvature tensor vanishing implies and implied by one another. Finally, as I said I should have done this first, but finally we proved the result that if I have a whole bunch of geodesics, I mean you take a whole bunch of particles and just throw and they are all following paths in the gravitational field and if I measure the deviation between the geodesics and ask how that deviation is changing, that tidal acceleration is again contributed by this Rainman Christopher then. Okay. So, this is the genuine measure of the curvature. Okay. Now, the one more point which I wanted to talk about, which, which I did not do at all and this is the way many other people introduce this, is you can think of a vector being transported around a curve, but it is the same thing. I mean if you take a curve and you transport along two different curves and compare the vectors, it is same as taking a vector and going around the curve. Now, the commutator of two derivatives which we worked out here, let me just make a comment on that and then we will go away to something else. The commutator of the two vectors acting on something can be interpreted like that. The way you think about this is the following, you take some coordinate system and let us say that uh, okay let me just draw a coordinate system but this is this is not supposed to be taken to mean that it is flat it is just two arbitrary coordinates so let me take xi as this coordinate and xj as this coordinate or whatever so you can take a a grid like this and take a vector at some point And you can say how that vector changes when I move from here to here and then I can move it from here to here. So, that is like the directional derivative along x i first and then the directional derivative along x j. 
which is what this d i d j will do to you. Instead, I could have done directional derivative along j and directional derivative along i, that is what the second one will do. So, if I transport the vector like this and transport the vector like this and I ask how much is the difference, that difference which is given here is essentially a measure of curvature which is present in this space. If you draw a nice parallel grid and a flat space and you do this, you will get 0, but that is because you are assuming that the coordinate grid is like that. You should think of it like some theta and phi or something and we did that. We worked out if you have theta and phi on the surface of a sphere, you can draw them in a flat sheet of paper, but when you go around this, it is not going to close the circuit. Okay. So, this is, this is another way of thinking about the curvature. You can think of it as the change which, which is affected to a vector when you go around a closed loop of some infinitesimal uh, size. But I like these better because these are a lot more concrete and it does not require any awkward limiting procedures. Okay. The next thing I want to do is to look at properties of this. This is going to play a crucial role in the rest of the course and this is this is the sort of the Mount Everest in the gravity course, not quite. I mean Einstein's field equations is probably the Mount Everest, so it is pretty close to Mount Everest. Okay, so, you have come up to the mathematically, basically we have done most of what you need and rest of it is mostly physics. So, you have obtained a quantity which characterizes the curvature and we have already said that it is the curvature which characterizes the genuine gravitational field which is of course, clear from here, because I know that if the geodesics are all going parallel, it is an accelerated frame. So, it is the deviation of the geodesics which is going to tell me that uh, something interesting is happening. Now, that also brings me back to another question which you asked, which is which I can probably answer in this way as well. If you take geodesics on a sheet of paper, suppose I take two geodesics, I can take two parallel geodesics, then the separation between them will stay put. But suppose I take two stride line which is cutting, then the separation between them will keep changing, but it will change in a linear way along the length. Therefore, I still get a good measure. I mean after all, if I take the first derivative of that deviation, I will get something, but that will not characterize the curvature, because I am still in a sheet of paper. I have a sheet of paper, I have two geodesics, I measure the deviation between the geodesics. The first order change in the distance between the two geodesics is not going to tell me about a curvature, because that first order change exists even in the flat sheet of paper per straight line. So, while you can certainly entitled to examine it, it will not give you what you want, because you can see that this is linear in curvature. So, in order to go to curvature, you need to do a minimum of second derivative, that is another way of looking at it. So, we also connected up with the physics and saying that this is what is going to characterize gravity. That is correct, but the point is in all throughout it will be linear. What you will find is that the rate minus some alpha naught will be there, so the sign will play. Okay. Yeah, there are cases where geodesics will cross. I mean, on the surface of a sphere, for example, if one at the north pole, if you take uh, two longitudes at the north pole, which is crossing, if you move along that, the separation is going to keep coming down. At the north pole, it is zero, and then it will just deviate. It won't be linear. That is the whole point. Okay, so on a on a curved surface, it won't be linear. Okay, that is the point. Okay, now you can also see the importance of this from the fact that we have been doing this Newtonian analogy at all the time. We are already getting second derivatives of this quantity, right? So if I do a contraction on alpha and beta, that is, I just multiply it by delta alpha beta because we are doing three dimension Kronecker alpha beta or if you assume all other terms are 0 and you do a g alpha beta, you know that it is going to give you del square of phi. So, you can already guess that if there is going to be a field equation in general relativity, which is going to reduce to del square phi is equal to some 4 pi g rho, which it should, this is the object on which the field equation is going to be written down. So, your field equation is going to be linear in the curvature and it is going to have uh, some contraction, so that some suitable number of indices survive. So, from that point of view also, it is very important to look at the properties of this quantity, which is what we are going to do next. Okay. So, let us do a few of the properties and then we will, we will do some more complicated ones probably in the next lecture. 
All right. So, let me wipe all these out except this definition since you may want to keep that in mind R k i j a is this. Okay. First thing which I can do is that I can lower this k and put a well let me write a m here and put a g m k because I know it is a tensor. So, I can lower it. So, this looks nice I mean you have all the terms put to it. I want to look at various properties of it. Now, it is going to be a mess. So, it is nicer to look at the properties in the most convenient coordinate system you can have, which means you go to any point and then you take the local inertial frame. The moment you take a local inertial frame, gammas vanish, two of the terms go away and you have only the other two terms to worry about. So, let us first write down the expression for the Rain Van Christoffel tensor in the locally inertial frame. In the locally inertial frame, g's are eta. So, I am going to look at it in local inertial frame around any point. So, your g a b is eta a b. I do not have to worry about its derivatives or rising or lowering etcetera. It is all trivially taken care of and your gammas, gamma i j k vanish, but of course, derivatives of gammas do not vanish that is the whole point. Remember in the very early in the lecture we worked this out derivatives of the gammas are like second derivatives of the metric and we did that x k in a Taylor series expansion then we said that look I can make at any given point g going to eta. Then I said at any given point I can make all the first derivatives of g go away, but I cannot make the second derivatives of g not all of them go away, but there is some residual number. So, in some sense we expect the curvature to quantify that and we will see how it does it is very cute and we will we will derive that, but before that we first want to look at the properties of r. So, what is this going to be? So, this is going to be r Uh, let us say m yes that that is going to be essentially k but let me let me uh, okay i will write it down at one go r m i j a is going to be here what i am going to do is that since these g's are going to be eta's i will take the first of all these two terms are not going to contribute they are gone in these two terms I will pull my g inside which I can do because the derivatives of g's are going to give me 0. So, once I pull it inside the k gets down here also k gets down. Okay. So, I can write this as d i of gamma m j a minus d j of gamma m i a second term always goes for a ride. Once I write down the first term, I only have to flip i and j and I am through to the second term. Right? So, let us see what this is. So, this is going to be half d i, let us write down the expression for this. We know that the special term is m. So, it is d m of g j a plus d a of g m j you are with me up to this point. So, this is d i. So, I have taken the term with m and put a minus sign here and then there is a term which derivative is with uh, the derivative is with respect to a which I have written down. Now, there is a term which has a derivative with respect to j right plus d j of something. I am not going to write, uh, should I, I should write it down. Okay. So, let me write that also down because the symmetries in this are, uh, no I think it is messed up. So, I will I'll come back to that. Let us go back here because here is where it got messed up because this was i and j is what I explicitly anti symmetrized I should have written it as a i j. 
let us let us be sure that that is correct because that is going to play a vital role. This m is like k, so there is a k a index, k a index, k a index, k a index. What I have been anti-symmetric all along was d i of gamma j, d j of gamma i. So it would have been i and j here. So everything will go go through here. It should have been m a i j. This is going to be d i of something with j minus d j of something with i with an m and a going for a ride. Okay. So, when I come to the next step, I have a d i of this quantity with minus m d j a plus d a of something, then there is a d j of something which I do not have to write, because I am going to write this and then I am going to take the one with j and i reverse and subtract it out. By the same logic that will cancel out. So, I only need these two terms. Then I have to write down the terms which are obtained by interchanging i and j. So that is half. Okay, let me let me keep the half outside. Plus half d uh, j. Rather, okay, I'll, I'll keep it as this minus the term obtained by interchanging i and j. So, d j of minus d m of g i a plus d a of g m i. Let us again make sure we have got it right. Up to this point we know is correct. It is d i of j minus d j of i with an m and a. So, then I said that there is a d i and this I expanded it out in which there is one term which has derivative with respect to j which I am not writing. So, there is a derivative with respect to m specifically put in and derivative with respect to a put in and this comes with the minus sign. Then the other term is supposed to be obtained by subtracting from it the term obtained by interchanging i and j which is what I have done. There is a d j and this term has a m and an i then this is uh, this j will become i and this quantity. Okay? Now, let us see what this gives us. Let us the first thing which you can see in this is concentrate on the m a indices. So, you have an m a index here and here also you have an m a index and they are coming with opposite signs. Here is an m a index and an m a index they are coming with opposite signs. That is good. That means, this quantity is anti symmetric in m and a as well. So, we originally had the property that R, I will write it here as A, B, C, D, R A, B, C, D is minus R A, B, D, C. This is we knew, this was the fundamental definition because it was always anti-symmetric in the last two indices. Now, we have shown that it also has one more property that R A, B, C, D is also equal to minus R b a c d. Okay. Then there is another very curious property, which is that if I interchange them by pairs, it will not change. That is, if I take i j and put it here and put m a there, it will remain the same. That is, i going to m and a going to j is a symmetry. If i goes to m and j goes to a, this is not going to change, right? i going to m and j going to a, this is not going to change. In this, i going to a and m going to j, m going to j is fine here, m going to j is fine here, i going to a is fine here. So, we have one more interesting property that it is also equal to r c d a b. So, this many properties are rather uh, relatively easy to prove. It has one slightly non-trivial property, which also you can work out from this, but I will not bother. You can, I will leave it to you to try out. Let me just write down what it is. No, that 
the symmetries will be true in any frame, because it is tensor. But the point is that it is much easier to grasp it in this local initials, right. There are textbooks where they actually retain the gammas and then show that even with those gammas this thing happens, but it is not necessary. You can just do it in local initials, right and prove the symmetry. Because you can take a tensor and do the tensor transformation law and check that each of these symmetries will be valid under a tensor transformation law. Okay. So, the last property which we need, which uh, I have not sort of uh, done it there, is if you do a cyclic sum on R A B C D. This is just a notation. So, or let me write it down R A B C D plus R A, you do a cyclic uh, sum on this. So, it is D B C plus R A C D B, this is 0. Okay. It is actually easy to see from that, if you stare at it large enough, large number of times enough, because you just have to, when you permute them, these indices will just go around pairwise and essentially since partial derivatives commute, that sum will vanish. Okay. You can, this is, this is an interesting condition in which you are leaving A alone and doing this, but the left hand side is actually a completely anti-symmetric object in all the indices. That is because of those symmetries, because whether A is here or A is here, etcetera, it does not matter. So, we have one completely anti-symmetric uh, uh, part of the R, which is going to vanish. Okay. So, this is the last condition. This, as I said, this I am going to give it to you as an exercise. Okay. So, you guys should try it out using that result. The crucial question is, given all these conditions, how many independent components does the Christopher tensor have? No, 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 that we will come to later, because I have not I have come to any of the geometry, uh, any of the differential properties of uh, R. These are all purely algebraic properties of R. Uh, yeah, it is similar to that, but it is just a cyclic sum on A, B, C, D, which is exactly what you have in Jacobi identity, because Jacobi identity involves the cyclic uh, sum of three indices. The, we have to count the total number of independent components in this, and again just for fun, I will do it in n dimension. Okay. It is going to be a bit of a mess, but it is worth doing. There is a reason for that. The reason is that we expect it the, to be the number of independent components of this. Independent components, you expect it to be what we obtained long back, which I believe is 1 by 12 n square into n square minus 1 in n dimension. Okay. The idea was that uh, if you were taking a coordinate transformation, having arbitrary coefficients like uh, a, b, c, etcetera, and then you choose this a, b, c, etcetera in such a way that the metric is eta a b, first derivative vanishes, and as many of the second derivatives as possible vanishes. We said that there were this many of them which is left. Now, this many should characterize curvature for us, because it also involves second derivative. Therefore, it should match with this. So, let us see whether we can figure it out. So, to do that, I will start with this property, which tells you that under pair exchange, this is symmetric. right? Now, let us say that any one pair of this can take m independent values. Okay? If the pair A, B or C, D can take m independent values, because under pair exchange it is symmetric, there are going to be only m into m plus 1 by 2 independent components. This is clear, because this is exactly the way we did for any of this thing. It is m into m minus 1 off diagonal components, half of that then add to it the diagonal, 
So, that becomes this. Okay. Now, what is m? We know what m is. So, this is this is let, let me call this some q or whatever. m we know is half of n into n minus 1. That is easy, because we know that it is anti symmetric in either this or in this. So, this is just a anti symmetric second rank object with in n dimensions, right. After all, if n is equal to 4, it is 4 into 3, that is 6, which is like FAB, right. So, this is the correct thing. So, you can plug that into it and that will that will tell you how much is there. So, we have taken in the account this anti symmetry in the first pair, anti symmetry in the second pair, symmetry under pair exchange. The only thing we did not take into account is this. Now, this I told you is that the left hand side is a completely anti symmetric object. So, it essentially will give you an independent condition only when all the indices are different. So, you have to choose 4 indices out of n indices in completely different way. So, that is going to be n c 4. So, your independent components must be equal to q minus n c 4. So, let us see what that is. That is going to be half, watch out that uh, we do not goof on this. So, it is half of m, m is half into n into n minus 1 then m plus 1. So, m plus 1 is going to be half, m plus 1 can be written as this plus 2. So, it is going to be half into n into n minus 1 plus 2, right. This is q and I had to subtract from it n c 4 which is 1 upon 4 factorial, 4 factorial is 24. Then I have n c 4, which is n into n into n minus 1 into n minus 2 into n minus 3, which is n square minus phi n plus 6, right. So, let us take all of them together. So, that is going to be 1 by 24, this is 8. So, there is a 3 left out and n into n minus 1 can also be left taken out and there is a 3 which should multiply this 3 n square minus 3 n plus 6 minus n square plus phi n minus 6. So, 6 and 6 goes, phi n 3 n gives me uh, plus 2 n and this is going to give me plus 2 n square. So, there is a 2 exactly 12 n square into n plus 1 into n minus 1 is n square minus 1. So, as I promised, this is cute. So, you have an extremely complicated way. I mean, this is what I find amazing or uh, enjoyable in general relativity. You had a curvature tensor, which was defined in a completely weird manner, which is not intuitive by anybody's level of intuition. And then you work out its symmetries. You end up getting all kinds of symmetries. There is, it is not that it is sort of uh, symmetric in all indices or anti symmetric in all, nothing simple. It is anti symmetric here, anti symmetric here, symmetric under pair exchange, and an extra condition like a cyclic identity. Then you go and compute how many independent components it has. And lo and behold, you find that it is exactly matches with the number of second derivatives of the metric, which you could not have put to 0 by any coordinate transformation you like. Because anything you can put to 0 by coordinate transformation cannot be tensorial. So, in some sense second derivatives of metric contain among themselves the components of a tensor in the sense that something which cannot be made to vanish, components of a tensor which has 
this many independent components. And Raymond Christopher then said nicely just picks it out. Okay, so that is what is happening here. So of course we are unfortunately living in n is equal to four. So only n is equal to four is relevant for us, and that should be twenty. Okay. So this is sixteen, and uh, this is fifteen. One three and one four goes away. Four times five is twenty. So in n is equal to four, there are twenty independent components in this curvature tensor. So of course, it also means that if you are comparing with the corresponding thing in Newtonian gravity, in Newtonian gravity it is the three by three symmetric matrix. It has six components. Now it has come to twenty components. Okay. So that is what the after all the extra complication that is all which we have achieved. Fine. Now uh, I have to talk to you a little bit about the differential identity satisfied by the Riemann-Christoffel tensor, and then we will proceed further. But there is uh, there are a couple of more definitions which I want to introduce before we go away. Suppose we have this uh, Riemann-Christoffel tensor, and you want to construct royal uh, uh, lower rank tensors out of it. After all, it has four indices, and suppose I want to reduce the rank of that. Okay, then we know that we can contract on them. I mean, using just metric and uh, the uh, Riemann-Christoffel tensor. So, if you start with the Riemann-Christoffel tensor written as R, let us say I J K L, we want to contract on the indices to get lower rank tensors, or I can even keep I here. Now, you already see that I can't contract on I and J; it will vanish. I can't contract on K and L, but I can contract on I and K. But if I contract on I and K, or whether I contract on I and L, they only differ by a sign. I can contract on J and K, which is same as contracting on J and L except for a sign. But contracting on J and K is the same as contracting on these two because I could have flipped J and I. So there is only one non-trivial contraction which is possible, which is a contraction on this J, uh, I, and K. Okay, so you do that and. From this, you can construct G I K R I J K L, which you call the notation is a little unfortunate. It is denoted again by R, so you have to count the number of indices to figure out which one one is talking about. J L. Okay. Now, if you Keep one up, you just contract directly to the middle one. I mean, you contract on whatever is possible. It is either K or L, and the first and the third is which is being contracted to get the get this thing. This is called Riemann-Christoffel. This is called Ricci tensor. Okay. Now, from this you can contract and get only one quantity because you can contract on that and you will get R, which is by definition G A B R A G. There it ends. So, this object, this J L which you have, it is trivial to show that it is symmetric in J and L. Because if you interchange J and L, it is just like changing this, but you are contracting on I and K. So, you get one symmetric tensor R J L and one scalar R out of this. Okay. One could have stopped there, but we need just one more tensor. So, I will introduce its definition. It is Usually denoted as G capital G A B, which is defined as R A B minus half G A B R. This is called Einstein tensor. There is a particular reason, not just uh, idiosyncrasy. There is a particular reason for choosing in this combination because it will turn out that it has some nice properties, but that. Require some differential identities called Bianchi identities to be derived, which I have not done yet. After I do that, you will find that this is going to be important. Plug what back? Yeah, you can do that. It wouldn't change anything because you can't use AB again. So you have to say GIK or IK. But then, then of course, you can write it in a slightly more complicated, formal way that you can start with RIK and write both these terms. You can even take this entire R I K L and then express this quantity in a particular form, but essentially that is all which you can do. Okay, 
So, this is this is a unique second rank, I, I mean given these two second rank tensors R A B and G A B which are symmetric, you can construct all kinds of things, but these are some unique properties therefore, we will we will use that. Okay. I will stop with that and uh, next lecture we will continue with more properties of this and relationships. So, any questions?